Rosario Dawson talks to us about her new movie, executive produced by Oprah. In the fantasy adventure, The Waterman, Dawson plays a mother suffering from leukemia. Her son runs away to a forest to find the mythical Waterman, said to hold the key to immortality. Dawson chatted about the film with our Brian Truitt. She had just returned to Newark after celebrating the birthday of her boyfriend, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker. What did you do for his birthday? We went to that really delicious place called Sticky Rice. Oh, I've heard of that. I've never been. Got to introduce my daughter to Bernie. <laughs> did she like Bernie? <laughs> Everybody loves Bernie. I feel like. Kids especially seem to love those mittens. How did you enjoy the first pandemic Oscars? Oh, it was beautiful, actually. And I, 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 mean, I mean, I thought it was pretty bold to have it be so in person, which I thought was really great. Um, it felt like now that I've also had my second vaccine, I feel like I'm going to start licking doorknobs as well. So <laughs> it just felt really great to feel like we were finally starting to get on the other side of it. And it was just really I think it's important. You know, the these stories, you know, one of the things that I think people have gotten out of this pandemic, as much as we don't consider artists essential workers, um, and that's not how they were talked about. I mean, I think it would have been very challenging for people to get through this quarantine without music, without, you know, film and television and, you know, binge watching all kinds of stuff. I mean, you saw it even when we were doing a lot of fundraising during the election, having table reads mm -hmm. and how much money was able to be generated because people were like, yes, I'm so this movie I've seen a mil million times. I'm happy to watch the actor who did it off script, hold a script in front of them and on a Zoom with odd quality of audio and all kinds of stuff and be so transfixed and excited and feel part of something. So storytelling and, you know, um, and, and art and music and all of these things are vital to our, to us as human beings. It's unfortunately always the first thing that's cut from programming and, and stuff for kids, but it's what makes us so dynamic as human beings. And it was just really beautiful to see that recognized and dignified um, at the Oscars this year and be able to see it kind of presented in the way that I think it deserves to be. Right. So The Waterman feels a lot like family films I grew up with back in the day, you know, PG, but just dark enough. You know, there's not a lot of leaning on technology. Yeah. What attracted you to it? Um, I mean, a lot of things. I think it is that awesome dynamic kind of film that I remember watching as a kid, like E.T. or Stand By Me, where there was young people as protagonists and who are, who are smart and um, independent and creative and imaginative um, and, you know, gripped, you know, grappled with like sometimes very serious matter um, and showed just sort of the landscape that exists for kids. I think sometimes we forget just how aware and present we are. Um, we can forget, especially now with kids kind of being on their phones all day. Um, but they're, they're, they're feeling everything. They're experiencing everything, whether you're relating in that, to them and communicating with them about it or not, like the protests that went on all year, the effects of being quarantined and away from their from their families, like you're not protecting them by not communicating with them. Um, and so I, I loved that this film talked about that, like the sort of intergenerational lapses that can happen and, mm -hmm. and how my character in particular was trying to fill in those gaps and be the glue to this family, but understanding that that is really what's at stake here. Because if she's gone, does this whole family die, um, mm -hmm. you know, unless they step up? And to see them try to figure out and navigate what that's going to look like, how they respect each other, love each other, see each other and value each other um, has been a journey I think so many of us can relate to. And the fact that it's done with a family of color um, and it still has all the fun, magical adventure, ma magical realism that I grew up loving and watching all these movies, but didn't necessarily actually see myself in, um, I think is really powerful because I think it is important to start um, being way more inclusive in how we do our storytelling and not keep relegating certain people and certain stories um, in, in, in ways that keep us separate, but actually recognize the full-bodiedness of all of us and give us the chance to relate to each other in that way rather than constantly keep having that the, those disparities hit and, and, and dividing us. Well, and like you said, you know, your character is very integral to the core plot and also the emotional heart of the movie. Was that a tricky balance for you to find in your performance, that parental strength for her son, but also still showing how the sickness, you know, ails her? Yeah, I think you you find um, you find strength, you know, in, in the moments that you really need it. Um, because 
love. <laughs> love is very, very powerful. Um, but I think it was it was really important for me to kind of still represent what she was struggling with, with as much dignity as possible. You know, mm -hmm. it didn't have to just be sad or, you know, um, a, a, about trying to express weakness, but really see this person's humanity and, and how she was trying to maximize each and every day, which is something I think we can all um, take note of because just because she's ill and she feels her ticking clock doesn't mean that her son Gunner couldn't be end up in danger and maybe mm -hmm. even potentially die before her, you know, like, so we, we have this weird idea of thinking that we can tell the future and we really can't. So it's so important not to, to dwell too much on the past. You know, she gets upset. She, she's hurt that she's not maybe included in so much of the conversation up until the moment when he leaves, but she doesn't hold on to the grudge because what's in more, more important is what's happening in that, in, in the present mm -hmm. and how they can, they can hopefully surmount this challenge and and get him home safely. And and I just think that's beautiful. I think it's beautiful that, you know, even it, at our worst, we can still show up and be our best. And I think that's an important lesson. I, I was experiencing that a lot with my dad at the time when I took on this film. One of the reasons why I really wanted to do it is because my dad had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And I was going with him on his chemo treatments and, you know, talking him through his fears of losing his hair and figuring out how we're going to change diet and all this kind of stuff. And I can tell you, it doesn't matter what age you're struck with an ailing parent, you know, it's devastating and it's really tough. Um, and, and I just thought that this film really respected that and, and gives people an opportunity to talk about it. Cause even if maybe you don't have this exact situation going on with you, we are all mortal beings. This is something mm -hmm. death and and our relationships are something we all have to be clear about. And I think this film shows you a really beautiful way of exploring that and hopefully having that conversation with your own families. How's your dad doing now? He's doing really well, still cancer free. That's good. He didn't lose too much of his hair. Um, I got him going vegan at least for that time. So he got an inflammation <laughs> out of his system. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been challenging. It's, it's a, it's a scary and really tough disease. He got, um, his diagnosis around the same time Alex Trebek did. So oh, wow. it's been scary, you know, kind of imagining what could happen. So we're not taking anything for granted, you know, enjoy every day that we possibly can, um, and, and love each other around, through, inside, up, above, above, all around it. Just love, love, love. Mm -hmm. What did your daughter think of the water, man? She hasn't had a chance to see it yet. I only oh, got okay. one. So I got one thing to to watch it. So she's I I walked her through the whole of the script. I've walked her through like when I had my bald cap and everything and talking her through it. But she hasn't had a chance to see it yet. So I'm excited because she's here for with me um, for my birthday and Mother's Day, and um, we're going to watch it on May seventh in the theater if we can. Oh, cool! Now that we're vaccinated. What's one kid adventure from your youth that you've introduced to her that she actually liked? Hmm. I mean, a lot of things. Um, Labyrinth, for, for sure. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, there's still a bunch of ones. Like, I haven't shown her Legend yet, which I think, I think she'd still like it. I don't know if she'll have the same reaction. For me, I was like, sparkly Tom Cruise, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to go. Like, I'm going with barrel-chested, hooved, and horned, <laughs> like Tim Curry. Darkness. I mean, what are you going to do? I have to say, that's definitely one of the things that came out of quarantine that I, that it was kind of amazing was seeing that character resurrected in, in this commercial that came out. Um, mm -hmm. I just I think what a dynamic creature and character. Yes. I mean, I love unicorns, but you know, <laughs> darkness, that's where I'm going. <laughs> she's, she's, she'll probably, she'll probably pick the unicorn. Right, right. Oprah was an executive producer on this. How much does it mean for a movie, you know, like this, a kind of a smaller movie to have her behind it? Oh, I think that's huge. Also specifically for David, because this was a passion project for him that he mm -hmm. came on board on as a producer. And, um, you know, they'd had another director who fell through kind of in the final hour and he sort of, he stepped up, um, to, to direct it and it's beautiful. His directorial debut is unbelievable. It's a really mm -hmm. stunning film. And, and I think, you know, they're friends and it 
was really empowering for him to have the support of of her as his friend and his um and just trusting him and believing in him to 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 more than pull this off to like really make it shine and um and to back that up you know um and and you know it's it's necessary this project has been in existence for a few years and has and has chugged along trying to to be brought out to the greater public and i think the the team that he coalesced around him and what his vision was made it happen and you know i met david um at an award show and like just like jumped on him like you're amazing i'm a huge fan of yours and he said you know and they said i hope we work together someday and then when this project came up and he thought of me for it i was just really blown away and i and, and it makes sense to me i mean he's his work speaks for himself when you're working with him and you're getting to spend time with him and his family you could completely appreciate and understand why so many people were the the wind behind his back to, to make this come to fruition. And um, I'm just grateful to have been able to be a part of it. You actually picked up and moved cross country during a pandemic. Yeah. Describe what that experience was like. That was intense. Uh, you know, my dad, he had finished his chemo. He'd had his surgery. He was just starting to get to the point where he was recuperating and could be more active. And then the pandemic hit and, you know, we were very scared for him um, and my mom, um, who's diabetic and asthmatic. And so it was just so much fear and stress and anxiety, especially after for him in particular, everything he'd gone through. So, you know, we just wanted to be home. We didn't see when this the, what the light at the end of the tunnel was going to be. And we're East Coasters. Um, and I was away from my boyfriend and we were away from my brother and family and he wanted to go back we all just wanted to move back. So we did. Um, but of course he didn't want to fly because that felt scary. Mm -hmm. So I ended up the only vehicle I could rent to, that we could drive cross country was with outdoorsy. Um, and it was an RV that was a bus, <laughs> like not a regular RV. It was a 29 foot long, 13 foot tall bus. And I had to do all the driving because my dad couldn't drive. Um, so I remember being like, you know, dad, it's, I get you don't want to fly, but it's not safer to drive 3,000 miles <laughs> in a big old bus, you know, but he felt confident that I could pull it off. And, you know, when, when I got him safely to New York, I remember him turning to me and saying, you know, you should get your pilot's license. Like, <laughs> this was a boat that you just took cross country. I believe you could do anything after this. So it was very empowering. It felt really good. I'd lived in L.A. for 15 years and it felt really good to leave it in the driver's seat, I have to mm -hmm. say. That sounds like a movie in itself that you and your dad went through. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, you know, you could tell which state we were in by, sadly, the bugs. It was just like, <laughs> you know, I knew we had finally really hit the East Coast because there were these like weird neon streaks. And I'm like, what? I was like, oh, fireflies. Oh, this is terrible. But yay, we're home. <laughs> you mentioned you're vaccinated. And it seems like there, we're, we're getting to the point where we can kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel. Have you started slowly getting back out into the world? And, you know, what has that been like for you? Not so much, really. I mean, I think, you know, um, it's felt a little bit better. You know, I've been driving back and forth. I'm on this project, Dope Sick, and it's mm -hmm. rich in Richmond. So I'm in Newark now. So I've been driving 10 hours round trip every weekend um, to go down there. And we're still in our bubble. And, you know, and I, I, I just still feel, even with the vaccine and everything, I just still feel very with my family's health and, um, and the fact that I'm working and if somehow I get it or pass it to somebody else, it could shut down whole production and all the people who are working, you know, there's just a lot of, as much as I'd love to be going out and doing a bunch of things, it's still not, it's just not the moment for it. You know, like I'll right. wait. I can wait until the summer. We're going to have, um, uh, a, on mother's day is my birthday and my oh, wow. uncle wants to renew his vows. So we're going to make it a Mother's Day slash birthday slash wedding. And again, it's just going to be all us vaccinated family members. But mm -hmm. it, it is that thing of we've missed so much in this past year plus that, you know, when we do take that risk of being near each other, we want to like maximize it as much as possible. So I'm very much looking to forward to that one day of all being outside in a garden, but being able to be together. You had filmed DMZ with Ava DuVernay. Um, what was she like to work with? She is one of the most incredible human beings ever. She leads with, 
emotional intelligence. Um, and I, you know, I've, I haven't had too many forays into directing some readings and I, and I directed a short film called Boundless. Um, but that's really what it is. You know, you're really managing all of these different departments and people's expectations and abilities and, you know, and the dynamics of circumstance, you know, did this location fall through? Did, you know, the wardrobe not show up? Was there a problem with this? And people coming to you with problems and their shoulders up and by their ears, like stressed out and being able to talk them through it so that they can get back in and, and do what they have to do and figure out what's the tone of the set? What's the tone of the story? What are we trying to create here? And she's just magnificent at it. Like she's just really loving. She's obviously, she started a Ray crew and she's, she's really about everyone you know, from the extras to the camera team, to hair and makeup, to, the cops who are holding down the street, like really just making sure that this, even when we weren't shooting in a bubble, it feels like this bubble is really loving space of creativity. Um, and, and you trust her because she's just so brilliant and um, so clear about what she wants. And it feels like such a joy to be able to bring it to her because she's, her energy is let's do it again. You know, mm -hmm. um, and you're like, there's 900 extras. We're exhausted, but yeah, let's do it again. <laughs> it's really good. It's weird because we're looking at it. We were one of the last productions to shut down. And literally we were shooting this scene where it was 900 extras for two days in a row, just a couple of weeks before we ended up having to shut down. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, when you're looking at the footage now, you're like, when will we ever shoot anything like that again? Right. Like it just feels it feels like 10 years ago, even though it's only been a year since we shot that pilot. But I'm excited that it got picked up and that we're going to be able to I'm going to go down to Atlanta and, and finish out that amazing story. The demilitarized zone. You know, I like my comic movies. Well, no, and I well, I was going to say, you know, I say yeah, I remember reading that comic book when it first came out when it didn't seem like we were on the verge of a civil war. You know, and how, how do you think that 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 show is going to be received now? I mean, are you, do you feel like it's going to feel very of this moment, even though it's kind of, you know, it's a 15 year old story in many ways? I know it's very prescient. It felt it at the time, but that much more since. Mm -hmm. um, and Rodrigo, the the writer, he's he's amazing. I mean, he's really you know, I've been sending him articles and things and, you know, after the insurrection, all kinds of stuff. We're like what's going on. Like, I, I, I can't even imagine how you're going to formulate what this script is going to look like, but it's going to be very dynamic, I think, for people to explore. And what I think is really beautiful is it doesn't just focus on it on the negative kind of aspect, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to just capitalize on trauma and, and, and stress and anxiety, but really showing how you navigate out of that. You know, it's, it's understandable. I think you end up having a lot of the like, is this possible answered already? You know what I mean? When we were first doing it, it was like, are you going to get people to like want to jump in onto this story and believe that something like this could happen? Now I think everybody's on board with that premise. Right. <laughs> now it's like, how do we get out of it? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's going to be really interesting for people to explore um, through this story. Um, I know between Ava and Rodrigo, I know, I know we'll deliver. Have you started training up for the Soka show yet? Or is that still a ways off at this yeah. point? A little bit. I haven't, I haven't gotten so much into the training as much as I'd like, because I'm totally anxious about it. <laughs> I would I'm imagine. Excited. Actually, that. when we go down to Atlanta, you know, a lot of the folks that I worked with um, on all the Marvel shows are all down there because they, you mm -hmm. know, they've been setting up and, and doing, they moved Marvel all the way down there for all the production. So a lot of the stunt folks are down there. Uh, I've worked with even some of them when we were doing Zombieland 2 and such. And so that's the plan that I have right now when I go down in June is to be able to start having some very, you know, full on training um, over the next couple of months and take advantage of their incredible prowess. You know, it's like the download. Whenever I have like friends, like my friend Tracy Thompson, I'm like, you went to Juilliard. So like, can I get the Cliff Notes version? <laughs> so that's what I'm going to, I'm going to try to get the Cliff Notes version of martial arts and see how that <laughs> I, I can be in the, by the end of just a few months. These folks have been doing it their whole lives. I'm like, there's, there's ways to kind of fake this, right? <laughs> fake this while doing it? Great. EGI, please. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one last thing you mentioned you're, you're filming dope sick now um mm -hmm. how's that how's that challenged you kind of what, what what can you say about that so far that's really powerful and something um i think a lot of people can uh relate to in the reality of of what this 
you know, as people are wondering about trust in our institutions and, and the people behind it, you know, we really, this is an expose on big pharma and particularly the Sackler family and Purdue. And you're going to see a lot of the same players from the FDA and DOJ, DEA. And it's a, it's, I think a very powerful expose on Oxycontin and the opioid epidemic. And I hope that, um, you know, people learning how this all came to be and how imperfect people um, who made very imperfect choices over many years is what really created this to be as devastating as it actually ended up being. Um, and and that we, we learn something from that and how we hold people better accountable and protect each other and understand and humanize this. You know, like what's happening right now with this pandemic is we're getting a lot of homeless people. And mm -hmm. it's like the second someone becomes homeless, you forget that they had a home, they have a family, they have dreams and aspirations, just like they're, they're now this, they're relegated to this type of person in our caste system that is supposed to be invisible. And that happens a lot with addiction. And, and I hope that not only is this an expose on these systems and, 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 and how we hold people accountable, as I was saying, but also in how we better relate to each other and see each other and help each other navigate these these crises, these crises moments, um, and still hold their humanity, um, uphold their humanity. Cool. Thank you so much for taking time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today Entertainment to stay up to date on all of the latest celebrity news.